Good evening all and welcome to the first of what we hope will be many of our On the Sofa With events, uh, live with myself and Vic Morgan. Uh, thank you all for tuning in and joining us this evening and I hope you've been able to enjoy some of the sun on this bank holiday Monday. Um, so first of all, my thanks go out to Vic and to Lee for joining us and to everyone joining us today. Technical difficulties already, <laughs> it's all fine. Um, so I'm Hannah, I'm the events coordinator for the Supporters Club. Um, and as I say, I am joined with by Vic, who I will introduce to you now. Hello to you, Hannah. Good evening, Vic. I'm just trying to start your video up. Okay, I'll start the video. There we are. How there about we go. That? Lovely. <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to see and you. And nice to see you too. Good to see you. <laughs> um, and next up, I will introduce you to Lee Peacock. So I'll just start his video at four slide. Good evening, Lee. Hopefully everyone at home can see you now. <laughs> yeah. How are you doing? You okay? Yeah, not too bad. Thank you. So I am going to leave you two um, and disappear off of the stream for the time being um, and let everyone bring their questions to you at the end when I will reappear. Yeah. Hannah, just before you go, we should say a very happy birthday for tomorrow <laughs> and also to Pete Norris from the Supporters Club, who uh, is also having his birthday tomorrow. Coincidence. But there you are. <laughs> happy birthday to both of you. Uh, congratulations on that. Thank you very uh, thank much. Thank you very much. And thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening. Um, before we get on with the chat, I should also say, um, as we always do, we are in extraordinary times and our, our feelings and, and our hearts go out to those who have suffered at this awful time and uh, our commiserations to those who have lost. And, and if you are still suffering, we wish you all the very best and uh, we hope you recover soon. And we should also say uh, that we have opened a Just Giving page for the Prospect Hospice. Uh, so if throughout the course of the evening you would like to contribute to uh, the Prospect Hospice, who do wonderful work for the community, uh, please feel free to go to our Just Giving page and uh, uh, donate if you wish. Lee, a very good evening to you. How are you? Good. Very good. Very good. Oh, well, as good as uh, can be in these strange times. You know. Yeah, we'll get on to your career in a minute, but I'm intrigued really because you are um, Head of Youth Coaching at Swindon at the moment, because we hear a lot about players returning to training, non-contact training. How are you managing with the youth team? We're not, uh, quite simply, we're not. We were, the academy system was the first uh, faction to go down from the club, to be honest. It was, uh, we had a, literally, we were told in the afternoon and then we cleared our desks by later in the afternoon. We were, it was more of a kind of wait and see type thing. And then from that, the lockdown kicked in. Uh, the, the difficulty was that we have uh, maybe a, a kind of hour and a half to two hour uh, radius where our players can come from uh, and travel to Swindon. And you, the elders, you start bringing people from different areas, it becomes difficult to manage. Who, and we, at that, those early stages, we've no idea what we were dealing with. So that was quite easy to close down and then the, the schools and that followed suit relatively quickly. So it was the right decision. Um, other than that, there's only uh, myself and Seamus Brady the only two who, who are not currently furloughed at the, at the club of the academy. My role is funded with the Premier League. Um, so my job just now, my job in general is working with the coaches, trying to produce better coaches, better output that obviously inputs into the players and hopefully we end up getting a better player through. So I've been doing lots of CPD events and uh, online chats and there's been lots through the Premier League, etc. to continue learning for myself. So it's been quite busy. It's been a different approach, but normally I'm working with them on the pitch. And to be quite perfectly honest, now and then you don't see a true, kind of truly what they're like because they think you're peering over the shoulders and that's not my job. My job is to support them and help them identify some weak spots where they can work on. That's it. It's about I don't know. So I've built a lot of really good relationships in this time. So it has been productive on that side. In terms of, uh, of this technology that we're using this evening many of us have struggled with it we've had to come to terms with it but in terms of your job actually it's been a bit of a help in this time hasn't it you've used it quite a lot yeah it's been fantastic the, i mean let, let's go to a kind of cpd event a continual personal development event that we do with, with, with coaches and we look to do more it becomes kind of one single one song 
where if you open it up to uh, a room full of coaches and everyone's got an opinion, there's lots of shouting going over, but right now this has been really good because the, the, the talker gets highlighted, he has his partner, obviously you have questions that can go in the chats and everything. I think it's been good. I, I think realistically we have to buy into it because it's going to be a major part of the future. I think a lot of these things that have taken place, are, they're going to be, become commonplace in whatever we do. Um, you know, certainly short term, it is just what we have to do, but I think some of them just end up with good practice. Like the likes of Zoom, I remember we tried something uh, earlier on the Facebook, but regarding the FA giving information, the Premier League giving information to other centre coaches, it's been, it's been vital, it's been good. It keeps you moving along. And then if I can pass any information to the coaches, hopefully um, we can keep a, kind of a level of production going. And you have no idea when you'll return, as it were, to the way you... That, that's still up in the air very much, uh, I guess. I, I, genuinely, I mean, I was just looking earlier, my daughter, she's in a final year of, uh, of, kind of secondary school, meant to be doing exams, and there's rumours of... It's not even... You can, I don't think you can even plan a week in advance. The, the numbers change so quickly there. The goals are getting moved all the time. So I, I would say realistically from our... Uh, academy point of view but we would be towards the end of the, the, the mm. season anyway so it'll be next season possibly after the school year comes back into play and I, again I, I don't know it's it's really really strange times and I think the good thing that we're going through just now is uh, the likes of Germany from a football perspective Germany are dipping the toe in the water so we've got an opportunity to learn from them what is going right and what's going wrong I just think that it's going to sound really bad, but the, the a lot of the British public and American public seem to think they're immune to it, and they can really push the boundaries in a lot of aspects. Now, granted, that you want to see your family that, but when you see our beaches being packed to the rafters, it's not going to help the course. It's not going to go away like any quicker with that, just for the sake of a quick day out, and everybody's on the same. The same boat. We're all desperate to reconnect with family members from far away and friends and have that day out. But while us in America, you feel the ones who are going to be really spiky through this, and that's not that's not me digging out. India, it's just what I've seen, you know. And I, when we go for walks, when you go for and you see now news regularly, our own people pushing the boundaries on a consistent basis makes it difficult, for, and it must be difficult. For Uh, well, we seem to have uh, lost uh, Lee's audio there for a moment. Uh, so uh, I'll just uh, share my own experience. I went on a, uh, a bike ride today, I live eight miles away from Dawlish Warren, and it was like an ordinary summer bank holiday with lots of people making their way uh, to Dawlish Warren. So uh, I can understand entirely what Lee's saying. We still can't hear what Lee is saying. So uh, there is a, a little bit of a technical difficulty. Hopefully we'll sort that out in a moment. Uh, just to, to remind you that if you are looking to donate to uh, the uh, Prospect Hospice, you can go to our Just Giving page, which we've set up, and uh, please feel free to donate. Are you there, Lee? Can you hear me? Yes, we've got uh, you back. Well done. Can go. I was talking <laughs> to them. I, mean, my, my, I, I try to change it, try to be kind of on the bottom of it, I'm going to go the old way up the time. Fair enough. Yeah, I was just explaining, I live eight miles away from Dawlish Warren. I went for a cycle ride today and it was like an ordinary summer day. You know, it's packed. So goodness only knows. We'll see. Anyway, let's uh, talk about your career. Um, you know, you started at Carlisle United. Is yeah. that right? Um, how was that? How did you get to be a footballer at Carlisle United? Um, I actually started quite late. I, I didn't start playing football till I was about 11 up in Scotland. Uh, kind of fell into it really going into secondary school um, from there just local football and I had quite an addictive personality in that aspect and just went full tilt everything was about football everywhere I went without trying to be a professional footballer it just kind of happened I ended up in the right place at the right time regarding playing with a good team playing at a good school played for district county and got noticed I was actually at Newcastle in the beginning uh, while I was at Carlisle, they asked us to go and train, played a couple of games, and they had centre back, centre midfield, and striker who were all playing for England at the time. And I went over and played, and I didn't feel I was up to the standard, to be totally honest. Um, 
so I'd not to say I took a backward step, but I was realistic about my my opportunities going there. And Carlisle was offering me a YTS, so I chose Carlisle, and it worked out well. Within my first year of YTS, I'd made my debut. Uh, following year, played with uh, quite a few times. It was quite regular. So, and then, long story short, the kids who were keeping who were at Newcastle came on trial. And to Carlo, they got a three month contract and went on. So I bypassed them by taking a different route into football. So taking that step backwards and reevaluating is a good opportunity for me to get my foot in the door. And would you say that to younger players now? That, you know, obviously you hear about the riches in the Premier League and, you know, they sign a contract at 18, 19, they're set up for life. But as a career, they may not actually get much game time. So would you say to them, you know, if you think it might be a step back to go to a lower league club, it may not necessarily be that in terms of your long-term career. The, the, totally honest, the one thing I could say, there is no golden thread. There is no exact pathway. Whatever way you take, just like anything in life, there's going to be risk and there's going to be a trade-off. You've just got to be comfortable with the decision you make. Um, some people like to be kind of big fish in a small pond and really prosper that and they make the jumping obviously really kind of struggle but um, there is no we at the academy we've got about four or five years I believe okay previous years no disrespect to the lads who have been on there but we've had we've sold what would be our said to be our strongest players to cap one team to bigger teams that come in and cherry picked and we managed to get young pros through we're coming into a phase where I believe from the under 12 to the under 16s coming to, and our current under 18s of next year, we have got some really, really, really good prospects coming through where we can lose players and I expect us to lose players because of the high quality we have. But now for us in the academy, it's about putting players out on that pitch, you know, getting, some, getting them to a, to a level where the manager sees the quality that's there and can imp can take that and place it in the team. They can know there's going to be weaknesses, but can see something they can hang his hat on and go, yeah, I'm going to put an in because he brings this to the table. And we have probably four or five years of the next conveyor belt of players that really, really excite me. Now, we talk about the easy one to go through is the Thompsons, uh, mm. obviously. And Naif was a young lad when I was, when I was still at Swindon. Great kid. Really, really, really good lad he was. I think Ed who's ever met him will say the exact same. Really down to earth. You know, we don't, why have we waited? Why, why has it taken so long to get there? And this is something that we in the academy from Macken and Seamus and myself, we're always reevaluating these things to, okay, what can we do and pass it on to our league based coaches? And for them to talk to the coaches and go, right, how can we get this? How can we get Nathan Thompson every year? Somebody who's homegrown, who's passionate about the club, but can also do the business. You know, and goes above and beyond because, because the key factor in that is because they're, they're so connected to the club. They end up buying into the club ethos and into the Swindon Town Football Club in general. Now, you, you moved on from Carlisle, didn't you, to Mansfield. I mean, between the two clubs, was that a, a move for, up for you? Did you feel it was the right move at the time? Your money was involved. How does it all come about? Obviously, Mansfield have to be interested in you. Carlisle yeah. having to uh, to be willing to sell you. How does it all come about? Um, it was a bit of a strange one. I mean, I, can't remember, I was about 19, I was about 20, and I wasn't expecting anything. I'd actually come back from a broken ankle uh, from the first game of the season but I was starting. I think it was South Henry played and I broke it. And it was it was strange how something, one person's can, uh, like injury opens the door for somebody else. It was actually the opportunity for Matt Janssen to come in. And Matt Janssen went on to play for Blackburn, was getting very quick playing England under 21s and closing in the first team. He was a really, went to Crystal Palace, then Blackburn, sorry. So that was his opportunity. So within the pecking order, I don't, I went down. I just got back fit. And, and obviously the, the management staff spoke to me and said, obviously, they've come in, they're putting a bid. And I just said, yeah, I, I, was, I was naive and I was open minded. You know, there was nothing keeping me at, at Carlisle at the time, no, no, you'll always try hard for a team, always try hard, that's a minimum of what I'll do, but there's only certain clubs you connect with for some reason, and at Carlisle, maybe just because I was so naive, I hadn't connected with them as much as maybe some of the other players had, um, who were more experienced, so the opportunity comes to Mansfield, and obviously there was, there was money involved, and 
it was just a, a new opportunity coming back fit. I'd been at Carlisle kind of three or four years from kind of um, under 15 playing local and then all the way through to being about 19. So I'd, I'd, I'd learned a lot, but it was probably time to move on at that point. It, it, how is the ethos between different clubs there? I mean, Carlisle, as we know, those of us who've made the trip many times, it's a long old way. Uh, Mansfield, of course, down towards the, the middle of the country. What about the ethos of the two clubs? You might look at them and say, well, they've got similar records, you know, both mm -hmm. lower league clubs. What about the two? Uh, the ethos about them? Um, you know what? The ethos, the ethos thing for me is more of a, a recent thing and you know when people talk about philosophies and what they're on top to bottom what they're all about and um, it was just another club I went there I was in digs I was in digs with the, the youth players and that um, I don't know I just had a, a, a kind of a good vibe from the place and again I don't know whether it's after my first few months it kind of clicked certainly the second season I uh, started doing quite well scoring goals for a because I was still a, a very young player um, I was scoring on a consistent base and leading the line, and it just felt, it just clicked, it just felt comfortable. You know, your bias shifts as a player. That's, you, you know, when you hear about, um, you hear players talk about the dressing room, fantastic dressing room, it's always when they're winning. They never say it's a fantastic dressing room when it's an average of crap. <laughs> you know what I mean? So for me, I was doing well, so I was enjoying it. So you enjoy everything about the club because nobody's getting on your back. I, me, my personality, I always took things very, very personal from supporters, and you could hear every boo and every noise. So at that point, it was going okay. So I really enjoyed my time, you know. And with that, I, I just felt relaxed, and I think that's the important thing when you see, especially a striker, when the when they're scoring goals that are going off anything, they'll just hit them and go in. It's just you don't even try. But then you see strikers who are struggling to form. They snatch everything, they try and blast everything, or they look for passes. That's the key thing that I look at now, is strikers who get in position and look for a pass. They don't look for the opportunity, you can tell the confidence as well. So that was just a, a time where it, it was just a, a kind of bit of a purple patch, and I really enjoyed it. We had, it's easy to say, we, did, we, we actually, we had a good core of the group. Um, I'm not going to lie, being totally honest, it's still the back end of the drinking culture that was in, and that was... It was part and parcel of the game throughout every single club. You know, we were just, I think we we were just expected to be mid-table. There was hopes of playoffs and everything. Um, but we, we kind of just dipped out in the first season. Then second season, I moved on again. So um, it was, I don't know, it was it. For me personally, it was just a great time on the pitch. I could really relax, really focus on my football. Done extra in training, all because it was just helping, you know. You must have done something right because uh, Man City came in for you. Uh, how did that come about? Um, I, I'm not, well, I, I'd heard through that somebody was interested. Being young and scoring goals and playing regularly, I think, can, uh, uh, sets alarm bells for a lot of clubs. And I knew towards the back end of the season, there was a lot of scouts coming to watch us from various clubs. And that didn't bother me. You know, it wasn't like a pressure. It really excited me. It felt like when I was playing as a kid rather than playing as a pro. Because um, you know you're doing something well and you know everything sparks a little bit more confidence. So getting that move, I mean, I was supposed to talk to QPR and there was various other clubs, but then went over, spoke to uh, Joe Rowan. Um, actually, had a, a phone call uh, on the night of my answer phone message my husband got and it was this call. Uh, yeah, this is a message for Lee Peacock. Uh, if you give up, um, a call on such and such number. This is the only member of the royal family to ever lift the FA Cup. <laughs> it was Joe Royal, obviously. <laughs> um, so he, like, he sent a message. I rang him back. Went over the next day. He showed me round. Uh, we had a chat, and I said, "Well, I'm still to speak to QPR." Um, and he goes, "Well, you know the size of the club. You know the size of the stadium. Anybody who wants to now go to QPR after this isn't as ambitious as I expected." So the contract may not be there. And I bought it and decided to say, hold on, hold on. <laughs> he pulled my bluff. I mean, and, and not that money, it's short of money didn't make a difference. I was actually getting offered quite a lot more money at QPR, but Man City was Man City. Um, but 
I mean, going on from that, I'd actually missed two games leading up to it, and I'd I'd, I'd kind of uh, not tore. I'd split my my uh, meniscus straight down, so it split, and it was causing kept locking and locking and locking. So I signed injured, and that was that took me more or less all the season. It was the back end of the season when I had to operate on it. It was a real real issue. So I never really showcased what I could do. And again, my big problem by the time I went there was I was given loads of opportunity and I, I screwed it up basically because again, getting involved in the drinking culture, which many did. The problem is I was in the drinking culture with the players who were playing and doing it on the pitch. And I was, I, I was injured and it was it was catching up with me regarding how I was seen from the, the coaching staff. So it was a bit of a wasted opportunity in my behalf, if I'm totally honest. Um, and it's, again, another thing you can't pass on to the players below uh, you. I mean, you, 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 you've always come across as an honest footballer. And obviously, people in life have regrets, don't they? I mean, and, you know, you've signed for a club like Man City. It obviously didn't work <laughs> out that well for you. Do you regret it or is it something you learn from and you just move on? It's uh, regret, yeah, massively, because it's what could have been as a footballer week as you went. I walked out on basically a four-year contract to go and sign at Bristol City, which was a great opportunity. But again, that would have been another wasted opportunity for the drinking culture that I was involved in. Um, but I see silver linings. And I wouldn't have a great family. If I didn't if I didn't take the route I take, I wouldn't have the family I'd have. I wouldn't be co- necessarily coaching doing what I'm doing. But fundamentally, the one thing I can do over Arsene Wenger, for instance, is I've made a lot of mistakes that I can pass on. I can tell you the reasons why you shouldn't do X, Y, Z on a consistent basis because it will lead to this, because I've done it. And so for that, it's, it's helping me as a coach. It's helping me gain perspective rather than judgment on players rather than just going, well, why is he, why is he doing this? I understand that. I'm from a council estate. I know all these things because I've lived them. Um, so, yeah, I, the silver lining is I get to share that information and pass it on uh, to, to the youth of Swindon, hopefully. Very good. Um, now, Bristol City, um, dare I mention it, uh, that, that team, obviously we love them dearly. Um, <laughs> big move for you, though, wasn't it? And, uh, and I guess it's fair to say it was a big, big time in your career, wasn't it? I mean, Danny Wilson was involved, former town manager, is yeah. that right? Yeah, yeah. but I, I believe he tried to sign, um, he was involved in trying to get me to Sheffield Wednesday previously, um, and then he went down. And I, again, it was pre season, and I just started to get fit. I was throwing a couple of goals in pre season. For City and yeah, Joe Lowe called me and just goes, We've had an offer for you. And it was actually what well, I'm one of the very few players that Man City have bought and sold for more money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you went you went for six hundred thousand as opposed to five hundred, is yeah. that right? <laughs> so I mean they'd made money on us and at that time we had the last uh Paolo One Chop. Paolo One Chop had just come in and George Weyer, ex World Player of the Year. So you start going down the pecking order. There was a guy called uh, Bob Taylor as well. I think he was at Gillingham previously. Really good striker back in the late 90s. He'd, he'd come in as well and you've got Sean Gore or Paul Dickhoff. Mm-hmm. So it become difficult. And I, again, my reasons for leaving were New City, not for my career necessarily. Although I, I did know Bristol City and it's like I knew the stadium and knew it was a big club and everything. But I just thought I've got myself in a bit of, I'm recognised as part of the drinking culture in the city, not down there, and then I moved and then you start again. Basically, you know, um, I, I actually bumped into Steve Lansdowne, the, the Bristol City chairman, before I'd met my wife the first couple of seasons, but again, a great opportunity, but me being me and still young and stupid was falling into the same trappings again. I bumped into him. Uh, not so long ago, and I, I just basically apologised. Uh, although I scored, it's not the fact that I, I didn't score and I wasn't doing well. I now look back and go, what I, should, what I could have done. And then as a coach now, I recognise the frustrations of, because people could see the potential I had. By the time I finished at City, I, I probably had seven or eight operations as well. This was the other thing that not a lot of people, I went through, I think it was 12 or 13 operations I had in total. And three... Uh, uh, Swindon, so everything as you're getting all this taken at all, and people still remember you when you were young and what you used to be able to do. Not they didn't know about the operations and everything you're going through, but it, was, it all started taking us toll a little bit later on, you know. 
In terms of, of your career at City, obviously um, 150 appearances, I think 60 goals. Uh, won the Football League trophy against Carlisle. Yeah. Uh, your first club. How did that feel? Um, yeah, it was good. <laughs> I mean, it's still <laughs> the final. There was again. It was what I was trying to say earlier that the you you have you you create ties with clubs. Some people do. Some people don't with with certain clubs. And um, Carla wasn't. I, it's not that I've not got fond memories, but I didn't have the connection there. I, like at all. It was just a club that brought me through. In the beginning, I did, and then it just slightly loosened. So by the time this come round, I'm in a cup final. I'm scoring. I'm celebrating. Mm. Now, would I do that against other clubs like Swindon? Not a chance. Absolutely no chance. Uh, because the connection is deep. But at that, it was just <laughs> it was a great opportunity, you know. Um, we managed. We won there. We, we, I scored, and I'm def- damn right. I'm going to celebrate in front of people. <laughs> We're better in the game, you know. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned Sheffield Wednesday earlier on. You did eventually uh, go to Hillsborough, did you not? On a free, yeah. is that right? Um, and, you know, it, it did okay. Playoffs uh, in 2004, 2005? Yeah, well, the, 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 the last two years at Bristol City, we got into the playoff final. Uh, so we got to the playoff semis and the playoff final. I got injured in the playoff semi final second game. Um, so I missed the final through my ankle. Long story short, again, another club assignment, Sheffield Wednesday, injured, and it's a lot worse than I thought. I had a lot of ligament and uh, tendon damage. There was an entire clear out of the guy. He'd done an operation, done the likes of Roy Keane, uh, me. He'd done loads of Premier League ones and goes, it's the worst ankle he's seen, not for it's the single worst kind of um, damage, but there's just so much going on. So I missed the first kind of three months, and then I come back and I I literally couldn't strike a ball ever again. The way I used to be able to do it, I couldn't hit it. Sweet. I rolled my ankle three times in the season and I didn't do the rehab. It's not like now where you've got a, a time that you come back to play. As soon as you can run, as soon as I said I'm fit, I'm playing. And that's the way it used to be. I go, How are you feeling? Good. Can you kick it? Yeah. Can you run? Yeah. And I'd, I'd lie over it and just to get on the pitch half the time. Um, but that that was my kind of downfall. So my entire way through Sheffield Wednesday, I couldn't. I couldn't hit top flight and I couldn't strike a ball straight on. I could side foot it and I learned that I had more curve and everything, but actually striking a ball was, it just jarred every time. And that's not an excuse, that's just that an absolute fact. Whether I would have done any better or, or, or worse, I'm not too sure. We had um, Chris Turner signed his, put the team together, then Paul Sturrock took over. And we obviously we got promotion against Hartlepool in the playoff final to get the championship the following season. Um, and by the time I, I, I kind of left, I had a bit of a falling out with the conditions of me leaving the club, which I felt were we really, I was being unfairly trapped, I'm totally honest, by Mr. Sturrock. Um, so you can imagine my delight with the way we left when he came in to be Swindon manager later on. <laughs> yes, indeed. It was it. Heart. It was iffy though, I think, wasn't it? Who signed yeah. you? Um, in a season that was difficult for the town, but. I remember your debut goal. If I, if tell me if I'm wrong, but I remember you sort of getting it on the edge of the box, and uh, and this was rather late on, uh, and then you slotted it into the corner. It was a great moment, I think, wasn't it? In front of the town end, if I remember yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, just I just remember going through, chasing. I come on the side, went over the top, and just kind of. I think the keeper half bottled it with the centre half, and I just let them kind of run into each other, and it was a bit of an empty goal. But yeah, to get your first goal is fantastic as a striker, but. Uh, the, the, the next thing is you get injured again, you know, mm. like that, that my knee, I needed an operation after this, the first week. So literally after one week of being there I, in training, just remember going over it and it's like, it was clicking and you know straight away, anybody who's had cartilage problems, you know when it's a cartilage, you get like a locking sensation and you're just not again, but you can play through it. You definitely can. And that was the idea in my head, well, I'm going to give into it. I'm going to keep playing because of the situation he was in. I knew 100% the players that we had in that changing room in my head. Going, I'm looking at these guys. I played against them and played with some of them in previous years. And I'm looking at them going, how are they down here? What is going on? I don't understand it. Once you get into the, the psyche of the team and once you get into how the team looking at the factions, um, you could see why they were down there. 
Um, it, there was a bit of a blame culture going on, and it was you can see that was carried out in the pitch. There was a lack of belief. People were just going, I'm okay, I'm just going to do my job. We're great teams, great personnel will always go, I'm going to do my job. I've got his back, his back, and his back all the time. And they're willing to put themselves in potentially dangerous positions to cover them because they know that he'll do that for me the next time. That's the difference between a great team and an average team. And that's why they're great players, but a very, very average team that we're never going to get out of it. You know, it would have been pure fluke. And that's no disrespect because they were all individually great players. But as a team, it was very poor. The mentality was poor. Yeah. Never, you know, nevertheless, despite the, the injuries and despite, you know, the, the trouble that the club is in, the relegation, things like that, you built up this extraordinary relationship with the fans. Can you explain that, the chemistry between the terraces and you as a player? Some players can come to a club and do wonderful things, but never have that chemistry. What is it about a player that brings that chemistry to the fans and him? Well, I think uh, what changed in me personally was I knew I wasn't the player I was. I knew my ankle was an issue, I knew my knee was an issue, I knew my back was an issue. So the one thing I could control was my work rate. The one thing I could do was the, those key decisions on the pitch. I can control how it was going to go on a technical stance, but I knew I could work harder. And I knew I could work harder than anybody when I put my mind to it. And I think after, I suppose, years of nearly being there and then gradually coming down, that was the kind of bottom end. And there was coming out of things with credit because I cared. I did. I gave, I gave a crap about it. The fact is I could have left at the end of the season and I'd offers to leave. I didn't leave because I felt it was an unfinished business. I felt part of, I was part of why the team went down. So I felt I had to stay and play my part and try to get them back to where they deserved to be, which was being in, in League One. Um, that ended up being made public. I was playing when I needed an operation and I left it until it was my literally mathematically impossible for us to stay up before I had the operation. And I think after having, again, no disrespect, some really, really good strikers they had in, but who were really in it for the most very selfish strikers. And when you're down in those kind of positions, you need everybody pulling together, you need everybody working as hard as they can. And it probably they probably didn't showcase themselves in the best way. And I think when I was playing, I obviously just hustled and hustled and I cared. I cared because I cared what people were thinking of me, if I'm totally honest. So if I can't control how well I'm going to play, I can control how hard I'm going to work. And if I'm going to have a poor game, the defender's going to have a poor game because I'm going to kick him up and down the pitch as well, if I'm honest. So what, I, what? I, mean, I think maybe the, the support is seeing that I did care my entire time. I did care while I was here. It was maybe why I possibly got more late more leeway than other strikers or other players in general, better players who they don't, some players, you, you, they do care. I'm not saying that any player, every player cares. They do. Some, some don't hide it well um, and some are incredibly selfish. I've always been a team player. That's just been who I am. And I think in, in tough times, that's kind of shown through. I've never been a great player. Never been a great player. I just always worked as hard as I possibly could to, with the kind of given talent I had. Well, it is extraordinary, th th this reaction, because, uh, you know, when you came back to the club, you, you, you went to Grimsby, then you went to um, Haven't and Waterlooville, East Phil, uh, Eastleigh and Portchester, uh, which is <laughs> yeah. uh, a, a lovely name. Um, I'm not terribly sure where it is, but it, it, it should be um, higher than it is. Uh, you were a coach at Eastleigh and then you came back to Swindon and there was mm -hmm. a general warmth when you came back. Did you, did you feel that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I remember going to the Tesco around the corner from the ground and straight away there was a woman said, it's oh, great to have you back, Lee, and I'd bump into loads of people. Great to have you back. And I don't think anybody really knew what I was doing, to be honest, because the head of coaching was a brand new role. It's funded with the Premier League and basically, I don't know whether people, people thought I was working with the first team or people with the youth team, but I'm taking the youth team and it's not. It's, it's just working with coaches. I'm desperate to get back on the grass. I love coaching players. I love it. Mm. Um, it's my absolute passion. I actually prefer coaching than I ever did playing. That is my true passion in life now. Um, but yeah, coming back, it was a real big moment. And then I'm speaking to obviously the guys over in the, um, they do the hospitality and everything. And they're saying about on social media, the kind of reaction they've had 
to me coming back in. So it was an amazing feeling. And it always felt like home coming back. It was always part of my dream. I remember when we played, uh, when I was at Eastland, we played Swindon in the, in the FA Cup. Yes. Um, yes, we yeah. remember that. Yes. <laughs> what a lot of people won't, won't recognise is Eastley's, Eastley probably had half a million pound more budget than Swindon did at the time. The yeah. players they had were all excellent players. So, and it was just, Swindon was going through a bit of a bad transition uh, at, at the time, a lot of questions asked. So it was just, a, I suppose Eastley played them on a, 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 a lucky time. But yeah, I mean, while I was down there, I was, I never wanted to be a coach. I wanted to walk away from football. I was done with it and, and then fell into coaching again and started getting my love back. And then you start thinking about where would you want to go? And I always knew I wanted to play a part in Swindon. Uh, and then I got the opportunity to come here. I mean, it was an absolute no-brainer. We actually we were living, my wife and my kids, down in Portsmouth. And my wife knew how important it was to find the next step and how important Swindon was to me and how passionate how passionate I am about our kids coming through and flooding the first team with great quality young Swindon Town players who've been come through the academy. That's that's the passion that I, I, all of us in the video staff, every single one of them, that's the dream for us. And that's what we work towards and we're coming a lot more close in it of recent on trying to make that dream happen. Well, that would be good to see lots of Swindon uh, youth coming through. I mean, do, are you going to make the next step up? Do you fancy being the manager? I mean, at the minute, I think we've got a manager that has united fans and team. I, I, it's an extraordinary thing to watch at the minute. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've been through these sort of times where it's not been a united club. We all know that. And there are problems that we see off the pitch at the minute that we read about, etc. Uh, but are you wanting to make that next step, step up to the manager's post at some point? A hundred percent. If you'd asked me a year ago, I would have said no. Um, I've learned from a lot of first team managers' mistakes, knowing what they're doing. I know that I've been close to first team dressing rooms, up and down the country, in and out of kind of coaching and speaking to people and, and learning a lot about it. I believe in myself as a coach. Uh, I think the coaching staff we have right now are a super first team level. Uh, we have like a bit of a head tennis thing going on with the first team staff against the first team lads and uh, like to get involved. And it's, it's it's refreshing. It's new. There doesn't, it felt, when I first came down to Swindon, it felt like a family club. When I, I remember 2006, it felt like a family club. You, everybody, uh, Adam Wainwright, etc., cetera, who were all working uh, in one department. Jill upstairs, and the hospitality, the players, the, the chairman, everything felt, there was no divide with the supporters. There was, everything had an approachability about it. And then I, towards the end, I noticed it changing, if I'm totally honest. By 2010, I felt like a bit of a change. And I still, obviously, Phil Smith, we've been working with us in the academy recently. He said that beyond that, the playing staff become back to become a bit untidy. And that... You, that translates off the pitch as well. Um, right now, I totally agree with saying the managers have done a fantastic job of last year getting getting rid of players who wouldn't buy in because it was his way of the highway and he stuck to his guns. And I was I thought it was a brave manager to make some of the decisions that he made last year, known and then known his long term plan to get this season and get it going and have a platform for the lads to go to um, is superb and. It, I had a Q and A with the coaches with Hunty a couple of weeks ago. There, so they could question what the insights of the first team. You've got to remember the first, like the gaffer and his his staff, to a degree. Him and Hunty are young, new coaches. They'll be learning a lot on the feet. That's why they've got a bit of experience now to give them guidance. But it's that young hunger that's going to keep driving them, driving them forwards. And he's he's getting a lot of things right. And they, they obviously reflect. They've got a great uh, team around them to support them and adjust what decisions have to be. It's, it's just a point, pity the season could have continued. You know, it's, I know we we got what we wanted, but for me, it would have been great to really steamroll the league because I couldn't see us losing the momentum. And I'm never normally like that. I normally see Easter as the opportunity to go. As long as you've got a bit of momentum around them, in and around the playoffs, you kind of see where you're going. But I just couldn't see this team. The lads, the way they work together, some fantastic players and really, really good lads. Again, it's easy to say that while you're winning, but 
what they were doing, which was fantastic, was as soon as somebody was dropping the standards, they would dig each other out to maintain the standards. It doesn't get the manager bulletin all the time. The players were hungry for success. And it just it was just a lot of good chemistry to get them to that to where they were, you know. And I think it's some of the football's been superb. I think um you, you look at I used to do a bit of commentary, come back to Swindon and uh, do the commentary, and I loved it, absolutely loved it. And I've got to be honest, at times, uh, when Coots and that were there and beyond, they were playing the, the best football through the thirds I've ever seen. Like the best football. But my, my problem with it was in the final third, when you have to turn the screw and up the tempo, it actually went the other way. And we were, we were the big six foot strikers, no crosses going in, they were stabbed us, stabbed us. They could outplay any team, no problem. But I, that season, when they play, when they play us, I've seen five, six, seven passes before you get into Nathan Byrne. I'm going, you hit him quick and he, gives the, he delivers the problem. Then you go to your four or five, six passes. That was just my thought. But what the gap has done this year, he's got a good balance. Play when it's on. Play to draw them in and then expose beyond them. If they're going to defend high up, we're going to go in beyond them. And you've got all the players, when you've got like, obviously Doyle, who's scoring goals. But Yates is an absolute monster. Mm. Yates, Yates is a machine. He will make terrible balls, good balls and great balls. And he will keep, so defenders can always get out of trouble and trust that he will run and make it, make it happen for the team. So I, 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 he does get credit, but I don't think he gets the credit he deserves. Oh, no, well, yes. Um, now, well, we've got uh, the time is running shortly, and I know you've got other things to do this evening. Yeah, let's be honest, it's a Monday bank holiday evening. You want to relax yeah. a little bit, don't you? Let's be yeah, fair. I'm just, I'm just uh, it, a coffee tonight. So, <laughs> so let's uh, bring back yeah. in Hannah because we got loads of questions okay. from fans for you. I, I mean, I have to tell you uh, or ask you, uh, we're at a time, of course, when you know this is the worst haircut in the world, and you are kind of renowned for your hair. How are you doing with the hair at the minute? Is it okay? I shaved this earlier. You can see part of it out of the bowl. Um, <laughs> a bit blind around the back, but that's what you... Uh, you can see oh, wow. A bit of a, yeah. a bit of state going on. I mean, I had the beard and everything. Now I've just got the tash. Um, I've got my Mexico 86 top, so I'm going with the PK tash just now as well. <laughs> it's just, hey, now is the time for experimentation, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. See yeah. what sticks. Yeah. <laughs> Hannah, I know you've got loads and loads of questions, so away you go. We do indeed. We've had quite a few in on Twitter and Facebook for you, so we'll oh. start off. <laughs> so Tim has a couple for you. Um, so he's asked, who is the toughest defender that you've come up against in your career? Um, so, uh, Les Scott, when he was at Wolves. When I was Sheffield Wednesday, we played against uh, Wolves. Johnny Lescott, because this is before, again, before injuries and just as he's getting the move. I, I remember I was I feeling fit, I was feeling good in pre season, and I made a, such a smart run. I think it was Glenn Whelan, played the ball over the top at 15 yards and no problem. I'm already in the crowd, going over the keeper, celebrating, and I blinked and took the ball off me, and I'm lying <laughs> flat on my face. And that wasn't the, that happened like every time I got the ball. He was an absolute monster. I think if the, if he if he was playing now, you'd see he'd be one of the top. Or if he was playing before, he just come through a period when England had amazing centre halves. Mm. You know what I mean? And he didn't quite get the kind of the recognition, but he was honestly unbelievable. Couldn't do nothing. Couldn't do nothing. I, I actually I, I had to shake his hand after got. My God, because I'd never heard of him. And one of the ex-players from Man City, uh, Mark Kennedy, I thought, who's, who's, who is that lad? Well, he'd been playing last year and that had gone, everybody's after you, don't worry. You're not the first one to do it. Don't <laughs> backside by him. So, yes, it was phenomenal. It really was. And his second question for you was, uh, what was your most painful tattoo and where was it? <laughs> um, <laughs> my fingers. Oh, yeah. And then, this is the thing, everybody's got tattoos now, you know, I, um, I start, I got my first one in 2000, uh, sorry, 95, and then I was really judged on it, and now it's a kind of a right away for, for mm. pro footballers, you're not allowed to be a pro unless you've got a tattoo, so the whole thing, I'd actually done it because I felt it was part of me, and I'd done it, uh, and it's now everybody's got them, so it's hard to stand mm. out, and 
but I have got something else I'm I'm getting getting done eventually. I'm getting Brandon on my arms. Um so I'll sure guess that when it eventually <laughs> And do you know how many you've got in total now? Put <laughs> 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 <It> counts up. <laughs> Over twenty in different parts. So yeah, it, it's all the same. It's just child scribblings basically oh, no, <laughs> it's just doodles there's no meaning behind it there's outside my fingers um, but yeah that's and i'll continue to get them eventually i'm just gonna i've not i've not had one probably wow in about 10 years now um mm. but it seems like once this is over now's the time i'm going to get back on again <laughs> they're going to be busy <laughs> what's left so might as well <laughs> Again, we've got a couple of questions here from Darren as well. So the first question for you is, who is the most committed player that you've played with in town shirt? Oh, wow. That's a tough one because you don't want to annoy the rest of your teammates, do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I look at... Really, really difficult. I think uh, I, I need to give a special mention to Craig Easton, if I'm totally honest, um, just because his his work ethic is second to none. Um, I, I can keep up with him. He did a few years on me, like, but I can keep up. But he was his attention to detail on how he went about his life and everything. Mm -hmm. Didn't get involved. He'd, he'd have a drink with people, and but he wasn't consumed by it. He just in training. He never had a bad training session. He always done outworked everybody. Um, he never pulled out of tackles, even though when he knew he was going to get. I would say, East is a lovely bloke as well. He's in coaching. He's coaching up in Scotland. I was on my A license with him up there, and you could see him going. You look at people like that, and you say, "Who can I?" left it all out there on the pitch and nine times that kind of people who do you think is going to be coaching mm -hmm. and while I was playing with Easton you just know he's going to be a coach and a manager he's got that talk nonsense half the time and think about it <laughs> but he's a lovely lovely guy you know I would say Easty I've never seen him be covered around the amount of times he'd cover behind me and then I go right okay he's covered I'm going to get in the box and then he just bypass me do both jobs mm -hmm. so I I've got to give a special mention to him he was and it, you, you want your, you, you can't ever mention your front line as committed because most strikers are just in it for themselves. The, if you're playing first and second, they want to go higher. Some special players, some great players. So your, your, your midfield and your centre half. Yeah, I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to go easy on that. <laughs> and Martin's got a similar question, but slightly different. Um, who was your favourite teammate at Swindon? Lukas Djukovic. Any I, reason why? Like very, um, well, I was living in Portsmouth at the time. I mean, going back to what I said about um, Sturrock, me and him had a bit of an argument when I left Sheffield Wednesday, came down, found out I was ill at the time, uh, and then found out he's made manager. I took that illness out a couple of extra days because I didn't want to face him. Eventually went to see him and he goes, and he, he apologised, sorry for how I was, I was under pressure with the job, he goes, I see what you've been doing. I was captain at the time, but AD was going to get me a cat. I thought, thank God, because it puts an extra pressure on me. And, it, and everybody loved how AD was captain. Anyway, and then we kind of, we, we kind of built the relationship from, from there, you know. Um, he ended up being the best man manager I've ever been without the pressure of the championship and everything because he just come from Southampton and then to go to Sheffield Wednesday and then he come to Swindon in a in a team that was on the way up because Wisey and Goss had set something in motion that and installed something I'd never known in football a real togetherness and there's a couple of stories that I can't really tell but it showed how above and beyond that Wisey would go for the team and he made sure that all the teams were. So I was living in Portsmouth and I, it was the first time coming up that season where I could not wait to get in training because I felt like I was learning. My entire time through uh, football, I didn't enjoy football as such. I, I, the pressure was too much. I got really nervous. I couldn't enjoy games. But I started enjoying it then. And I was living in Portsmouth and Luca was living in Southampton. He was a young lad. And I was picking him up every day. 
and we would we would travel up, so we spent a lot of time together. And I think at times what's been difficult for me is that I've, I've been later on in my career I got hit as a target striker. When I was never a target striker, I liked working off the striker. Now I'm having to do all the kind of legwork. So when he come in, we were able to kind of share the load, then eventually we're back in mm-hmm. midfield. But he always knew he was going to go on to greater and um, all the great things. He's such a good player. A couple of injuries have let him down in that, but I absolutely love him. still speak to him now and then. He would be a real obvious one. Uh, Phil Smith, Smudge lives around the corner. Um, mm-hmm. I've gotten involved with the academy. Well, me and Mac have gotten involved with the academy. He'd be another one who never really kind of. We were good friends all the way. I think more now. We're kind of really good friends as such. But yeah, Smudge and Luca. <laughs> okay, we've got another question here which asks Is there a player you played with that frustrated you the most? And if so, who Robert. was it? Christian <laughs> Robert. And people, people, but I could see why fans loved him. I mean, really up because he was so unpredictable. But you imagine being a striker with that unpredictable. He never ever looked for me. I was a kind of byproduct of him running into a defender, maybe getting the ball. He was an awesome player. If you just go down the outside ball rather than cutting in, it would be <laughs> superb. But he was so good with his left foot, he'd cut in and then just smash it. Um, yeah, because. I think my frustration with Robbo was the fact that I felt that we could have been really, really good and we actually really got on as well. But on the pitch, oh my <laughs> lord. <laughs> the amount of my fantastic hairstyles I had to pull out because of him. <laughs> he pulled his hats here. I to blame him. Yeah, no, Robbo was a great player, but uh, he was frustrated. But there's other people who are frustrated for different reasons. I look at Andy McNamee. Andy McNamee is probably the best player I ever played with. Andy McNamee was outrageous. Like, so in training, I wouldn't go anywhere near him. I genuinely wouldn't. I'd just let him get his tricks out of the way and cross it in front of me. He can just have the ball. And I've never done that with anybody. He was amazing. But he was so... You know, turn up today and turn it on. I don't know if any of you remember we played um, Portsmouth pre-season. And he was... Uh, they had like, literally internationals playing uh, across their back line and he shredded them, completely shredded them but it was just he couldn't find the consistency so my, my frustration with him was he should be a Premier League player in my opinion he was so good but it was a different kind of frustrating Yeah, I would agree on that Okay, the next question we've got for you is what is your most memorable moment whilst playing for Swindon? Oh, final whistle against Walsall Unbelievable for two teams in red to get promoted on the same day, and their support picking up our players and the the whole atmosphere, the party that was going on. That 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 is my favourite memory in football by a million miles. Um, I know I've, I've had promotions before and won kind of uh, the LDB final and everything, but that was done, I believe, with a, a very average team. I don't think we had any outstanding players or anything like that. We just had a great chemistry. We know we could go 1-0 I think me and Rob went top scorer on 12. we go 1-0 up and we wouldn't, we try not to kiss it. Do you know what I mean? It was very Mourinho-like. Mm-hmm. But we, we knew what we were capable of. And that was for that season to go the way it did and then on that final day I'll never ever forget. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> Yeah, the final whistle for the fans was pretty special, Lee, I can tell you. That was a great mm. moment. <laughs> yeah. it, it definitely was. Um, so Swindon Sparkle has asked, you played in a number of different positions, but which one was your favourite? If I'm scoring up front, if I'm not in deep midfield, <laughs> I, think you to put it. I think, again, going back to what I was saying earlier, I think the frustration is, um, uh, it's all good. Like, if I didn't have the injuries and I didn't have X, Y, Z, and where would I be? But I did. So I actually enjoyed it uh, that season in midfield. I really did. It was me and Pookie. And Pookie had a lot of energy, but I got to I got to chip in with the odd goal. I started up front and then went back because I knew I could protect that back line. I knew anything. It was not a lot of football was on the floor, but I knew I could protect them in the air and I knew I could win tackles and I knew I could win it and go simple without complicating it at that level. I really enjoyed that and it's 
actually all the way through my career, outside my time at Bristol, when I was at Man City, Joe Roll was converting me into centre half. All the way through my career, I've always played midfield and up front. So, I, I was, yeah, probably 50 50, if I'm totally honest. The amount of games I played in midfield and up front, I played right back, left back, played in goals a few times, played in the right wing. Um, but yeah, deeper in midfield, if I was going through it now, I'd quite like to be in there. Knowing, if I knew what I knew now, I, I, I know I could change myself as a player as well. Knowing the, the, the techniques on coaching, on how you can get the best out of players and how to change their game. I didn't think when I was playing I could change. I just thought, this is who I am. This is who you're always going to be. You can actually adapt it with the, with the right mentors above you and the right kind of framework to work from. So, yeah, I, I think deep midfield. Because you get to kick people when you're frustrated up front. You can't, it's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a question from Paul as well. So how are you enjoying your current role at the Academy? Yeah, I enjoy it. I'm, listen, I'm internally, eternally grateful just to be in the door. Um, any of you who's full-time in football, like I said, I, I went through my entire career and I maybe watched about six games on TV while playing as a pro. Never watched them. It was a Rangers Celtic game in the pub. That was about it. I now watch everything all the time. I study the game in a complete, uh, complete different way. Um, so the one thing, I'm working with coaches now and I love it. We've got great, great coaches, great people who have got great futures ahead of them. But I miss coaching players. I really, really do. Uh, going back to the question, do I want to be first team manager? Yeah, I do at some point. I'm not in a hurry to go anywhere I can't handle. I've got a lot to learn. Uh, but I think sometimes you have to be put in a position and learn on your feet a little bit or you, and take opportunities when they do come up. Um, I would just, I know at some point down the line, I would, I would love the opportunity to be part of the first team staff at, at Swindon. But again, it's opportunities that come up. You need to be in the right place to, you know, I mean, to be able to get, uh, be able to take them. But I'm coaching on the grass is my, my real passion in life right now. Yeah, so sort of following on from that, so Malcolm has said it's great to see you in a role at the club. Um, and his question for you is, I think we all know the answer, but which two clubs would you mm. refuse to sign for? Bristol Rovers <laughs> and Sheffield United. Oh, oh no, and Oxford, I need to go three. <laughs> I was waiting for that one. The, thing, the weird thing is, I forget about Oxford because I've never played against them at Swindon. They were never, they were always down kind of wherever they were, just floating about in the, in the mire. Um, so it was Bristol Rovers. I've, 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 because I remember we played Bristol Rovers this season, maybe not, and a couple of our su elderly supporters got attacked by their fans and already hated them. Um, and that just kind of fueled the passion for hating them a little bit more. Then Sheffield, Sheffield United, again, I got grief from them. But Oxford have never been a thing for me. I've just never recognised them. But <laughs> since coming back, I've probably realised it more because we didn't have a playing connection with them at mm. all. They were never mentioned. If anything, the only time they were mentioned is Swindon supporters actually wanted them to get promoted to bring back the Derby days. That was the only time. They were just insignificant to us. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, let you, we'll let you off there, we'll, you can have three. <laughs> okay, so we've got a question from Mark as well. So he's asked, which manager do you feel got the best from you as a player? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough one, it really is, because all impact in different ways. As a team, like I said, there were 2006 as a management team, uh, Glass and Wisey, and then what Paul took over and done was phenomenal. His man management skills were second to none. But when I was at Mansfield, there's a guy called Billy Dearden there. And he just, he, he, he kind of drills were just kind of shooting and five aside. This is what we do, we just go and enjoy it. All the best players. He, he looked at the likes of Brazil and everything. Every time you see Brazilians play, they play my smile on their face, play with passion. So just enjoy it as much as you can. And we started doing okay with that kind of ethos. When I went to see Danny Wa, uh, uh, Danny Wilson was really good because he believed in me more than I believed in myself, if I'm honest. He kept pushing me, kept putting me in when I think a lot of managers would have just gave up with some of my antics and everything. He was really good. So there's been loads of bad, real positive effects on me. But can I be honest that some of the biggest effects on me now as a coach is watching the coach managers and the mistakes they've done and how I've been treated and how they treat players. So some of the biggest 
impact for me has come from a, a lot of negative things that's happened on learning how not to do things with, with people and it's football now isn't like it used to be you need to get people on side you need to get people believing in them so um, I've learned a lot of how to take away a lot of their negativity for players and get them believing that's kind of how I operate now and I wouldn't know how to do it if I hadn't been under some of these uh, less favourable managers <laughs> so polite how I could put that can you name any names there? there. <laughs> okay, we've got another question. Uh, so, who was your roommate for away games whilst you're at Swindon, and what was your funniest memory? Oh. I think we, we always connect. I've actually roomed with Robbo quite a bit. Um, There is, is things that can have happened that can't really be. There's a lot of pooing in wash bags going on in their underwear trips and stuff like that, getting the keys so when people are down at dinner and then go back and you go, oh no, somebody managed to get the keys from the front. There was a lot of those type antics going on. It's <laughs> great when you're doing well, but people were losing their head when we were just mid-table cannon fodder. Mm, I can imagine. There's, yes. there's, nothing, there's nothing kind of new. There was a time where somebody, there was the wall lighters, the up lighters on the walls in the hotel, you know, behind the, behind the beds. Now they're about three foot up and somebody managed to get in and curl one out into one of those lights. <laughs> So you've turned on the light and it's burnt. <laughs> so yes. There's a lot of poo stories going on because that was the level of the, the, kind of, the banter going about then. But there's, there's a lot of things you can't say, but that's about the most, the furthest I can go with this poo story. It's so childish. <laughs> this sums up footballers in general. <laughs> so we've got a couple of questions here from Pete. So he's asked, do you feel that there's more pressure on you and the guys at the academy to, to produce players for the first team following the losses that clubs are taking as a result of the current pandemic? Um, that one's really pressure. I know, I know what our, I know what our coaches and our players are um, capable of. I th I'll go back to, I think the next four or five years of players will be there. We won't just be going, is he good enough? Uh, like he is good enough, sorry. We've got, they are good enough. There's going to be a, a larger spectrum of players available and hopefully making the first team manager make difficult decisions. Right now, I don't, I don't believe it. The last few years, it's been as difficult, but I believe in the players we have. I believe us as, uh, as academy staff are uh, always thinking forward. We're always looking to change things. We're looking at the season. Not We could have a great season. We could do absolutely never lose a game, but you still want to see the cracks so we can move forward and adjust things. And we have people who are supporters and uh, people who have come in and bought into the club at that kind of level who are really passionate about developing these kids and letting them live their dreams. You know, that's what it's about. It's about these kids living their dreams. And if you're passionate about your job and that reflects something, then they buy into what you're doing. And this is what we're starting to create. Um, you see the likes of Harry Parsons got introduced last year as a first year scholar. If you've seen Harry a few years ago, a fantastic player, very up and down emotionally. He's, he's fought the battle of the demons with that and he's become such a consistent player that he's got his opportunity and he'll get more and more and more. And he's he's the tip, he's kind of the first year of, and there's more within that age group, of lots of young players coming through that really, really, really excited. It's not pressure. The, the pressure is us as coaches creating a platform and an environment for them to flourish. That's the pressure, not from abroad, but do we provide a better uh, platform for them to showcase what they're all about? And the second question we've got from Pete is, how do you think or how would you like to see the League One situation resolved? <laughs> um, well, then I'm not bothered. As long as, <laughs> as, long as we're up there, I, I, I think we go. I would prefer it to be games. I think that's the, the fairest way you can do it. If you have a look at the, the German scenario, is really interesting because they have... People are worried about, oh, we want to have the home territory to win games. But it's the away teams that are picking up points. More often than not, it's kind of massively shifted out there. Now, whether that's 
at home, when you're getting beat, your fans put you under pressure. I think we can all agree that. And they're all like, as soon as that first goal or the first miss, it's like, oh, that reflects on the players. So not having that is maybe a boost for some of the lower teams. I think it would make it incredibly interesting. I think we'd see a big turnaround on a lot of teams. But for me, there's going to be nothing like having supporters in the ground and playing it there. That's not going to happen sorry, for quite a while. So if we can just get back to games, that's going to be the best way to do it. But I can't see it happening. I just I think we're too far behind the curve. Because I mean, you look at the Premier League, they're behind German. Um, Germany's so far behind, so it's going to be really, really difficult. Because now you're going to force players to play so many games within a week, and now players out of contract. Um, there's so much from the sports science about too many games, too much training, and injuries. So that excuse will start coming out. So it's a really difficult scenario. If it was a couple of weeks ago, you'd say games. I can't see it really being a, a viable option now. Um, but I don't know. No. Okay, we've got another question from Mark. So we've got Lee. We've been outdone by some big physical sides this season, the likes of Colchester and Newport. What do you think that Richie needs to do to overcome this potential problem for League One next season? Um, I, I have every faith in uh, the first team staff. They'll, they'll, they reflect really well. They go through everything. I don't, think, I, don't, I don't think... So you watch Newport play or you watch whoever play, and you come up with a game plan, and you understand that they're going to be physical, but you try and neutralise the physical by, by actually taking that away. The only way they can be physical is if you stay on the ball too long. You've got to move it in areas, draw them in to expose them beyond, or, or whatever it is, they're going to play back, play in front, create your opportunities. Anyway, so they've always had a game plan. I just think now and then, the nature of the beast is you are going to get beat at some point. Your game plan, they're going to take a big dump on your game plan at some point, and you learn... From that, the great thing about the first team this year that I massive credit to them is they've always bounced back. How many times you have been support for, and I've been I played for four years here. Once you got beat, you start seeing that become a consistency. It's like you think you're drawn in, you're beaten, and you maybe win, and you you lose. The first team will bounce back straight away every single time because the management have reflected on it and adapted. You can't that game's gone now. If we play them again, we adapt the, the game plan. So I think that's credit where credit's due. They won't over overanalyze it and let it affect the next game. But there's a time that you're going to win games when you don't deserve to win. You're going to lose games when you deserve to win. And that is this the reality of football that we it pains us. It absolutely pains us. It, it can't be as consistent as you want it to be. Um, but fair play, they've, they've found a, a bit of a magic formula on bounce back ability, um, which I haven't seen. I haven't seen. That's why they've done so well. They've caught me off guard so many times this year because they've gone, you can see this period being really sticky. They get beaten that game. You can see that going away. And then they did get beaten that game. And then they bounce straight back. It's like, wow. But that's the staff. That's the players' mentality. Um, it's quite a special bunch. And I've, I speak to the players quite a bit. Nothing to do with coaching that, but in the, in the change room and when you've got people like Anthony Grant now introduced to you, you can't have a day off because he'll bite you, basically. <laughs> he will kick you up and down the corridor. Mm -hmm. Never mind out on the pitch. He meant he's people like that who maintain standards. It's a reflect he's a reflection of the first team management staff and the rest of them buy into it. You know, it's been and that's why it's been such a successful season. Mm. Would you agree? Uh, so we've got a question from Jason Haynes here. So there was a fan called Paul Wiltshire, who does a very good Lee Peacock impression, uh, we've heard at most games. Have or a Peacock impression? Sorry, have you heard it? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> the thing is, I'm not on social media anymore. So I tell you what, the next home game we're there, bring him down. I want to see it. <laughs> That's it. I want to see it unless he can get it up on here and share it with you. Yeah, we'll have to see if we can get hold of that one for you. <laughs> get it on YouTube. Get it on YouTube. Get on YouTube. Have a view on there. I'll share that yeah, into yeah. Twitter. I know Paul. I know Paul Wiltshire, so I send him a message. Get him to do it somehow. We'll 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 show it to you somehow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the final question we've got on this part, so we've got is from Gary. So he has asked, "What was your favourite memory from the Ibiza tour in 2006?" It's it's a bit of a strange one. So we, we, <laughs> we, 
we go out there. Why we had a really good thing that um, if you're over 30, you weren't allowed to train Sunday or Monday. He looked after you. And it was a good way of doing it. So you got an automatic day off. But I turned 30 in October 29. And what he had was uh, you were allowed to go out till I think it was one o'clock in the morning. You weren't allowed to gym, but you could go out into the into the town, wander about and everything. Which all, some of the lads took to the most extreme. But as we're coming up all the time, there was always the over 30s and Dennis Wise and Gus Byer always on the way down. You'd see them come, you'd see them in training the following day with the same gear on, which would say exactly how they treat the your management staff treat their kind of the whole IB for tour. Yeah. When you're out there and you see the fans and that as well, and be able to have a drink with them and talk about the season is really good. But every single night, if you could see all of our lads just kind of walking past, and they would always, we'd always walk up by the beach and they'd always come the other way, and they'd just be sat there with a bag have a good night, boys. Sleep well. Just rolling <laughs> our faces every single night was so painful. But we had that one opportunity to go out at the end, which everybody absolutely abused until they had to go to the airport. We <laughs> had uh, nearly had a couple of casualties on as well. Uh, but it was well earned. But see, the, the good thing about that is where it's, it's not it's, it's work, but by the end, you've got you're in with all the punters as well who are treating it like a holiday. You can have a proper good laugh with them. It's not like the pressure of the season, so it's slightly different. Mm. Um, so it was good. We had a good, uh, good crack with a few of them as well. <laughs> okay, and we've got some quick fire questions just to finish on now. So the first one is Swindon or Bristol City? Swindon. <laughs> right answer. I think I did get that from my commentary from the Swindon Bristol <laughs> City game. <laughs> got a bit of stick on that. <laughs> <laughs> Question two: Who is the player with best dress sense? Me. <laughs> all the questions <laughs> very fruity all the time. <laughs> Next one, player with the worst music taste. Has Neil Joffrey because he's trying to be a teenager all the time and trying to you just gotta go go hold a bit gracefully. Uh, <laughs> and most people would say that I, I like a bit of rock in there in the dressing room. Easter used to play his guitar on away trips and stuff like that. Lads were having none of it, but Hasney just had to, he was trying to get in with all the young pros in that, so he's still cool. <laughs> the favourite, your favourite ground you've ever played at? That I beat the one. <laughs> 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 that was pretty decent. No, um, da, 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 da. obviously, I mean, this, this town there, going, shooting down at the town end always been special. I liked Hall Away. Weirdly enough, I liked Hall Stadium. Played in Millennium, played in Old Wembley and everything, but um, yeah, going to Holloway felt like a foreign stadium. I've always liked that kind of uh, atmosphere, that kind of look and feel. Mm. That was down to easy enough that. Okay, next one we've got is best goal you've ever scored. Um, I would say FA Cup. In our first round it was at Carlo. We played uh, who, who did we play? It was well, Gateshead, I think. The ball came in, two defenders come in, I just need it over my head, span, and then kind of scissor kicked it on the ball in the far top corner. And then, <laughs> yeah, that was kind of FA Cup. I was about 18. From the touch to the strike, I've no idea what happened. It just mm. uh, all this madness just fell into my path and then managed to smash it in. Uh, yeah, it's on YouTube. It's on there somewhere. And that's another, <laughs> I've never I've just sent uh, two of my goals that I scored for Mansfield against Man City, and I've never seen them before. That's what how, what I was like. I never ever watched my own game. So most of the goals, I, I reckon probably ninety percent of the goals I've scored, I've never seen. But that is one I've seen. No. We'll have to see yeah. if we can dig that one out for you as well. <laughs> Honest to God, if it goes in from two yards, I now try and get the kids to appreciate the sweaties from two yards because they're proper team goals. Mm. Apart from that, I was never skillful enough to do any good individual goals. Uh, <laughs> and a question to finish off that we've had a few times actually is: Do you still have your infamous coat that you always wore? I'll never sell that. I'll never sell <laughs> that. I'm hoping that if I do live my dream and become part of the first team staff and get a promotion, I can get it up in the Swindon tro uh, trophy cabinet upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 my dream for the court. I'll never get rid of it until it's in there. That was the only place that goes outside my cupboard. Um, but the, the with I wore it. The last time I wore it was the 
Preston game. And that was, I've not worn it. Oh. I, went, I went to the Chesterfield game and I went to the, the Preston game. And then I thought the next time I'm going to go off, I ain't going to go on the ball game. I didn't wear it on the Chesterfield, but I wore it with Preston. But then you start looking at 90% of those players didn't turn up. They were already in Las Vegas and already sorted their contracts elsewhere or go back to their things. So it was outside Nathan getting injured. There was zero passion. From a lot of them, uh, so I'm not going to blame the court for that. I'm going to blame them. The court still got some. <laughs> <laughs> right, I think that's all the, the, the questions that we've had in. And, and as you'll notice, me a lot from people, which is again indicative of your uh, sort of popularity with the fans, which is fantastic. And uh, we should also say thank you ever so much for sticking around for so long because we originally planned for 45 minutes. We've now well over an hour. And, as you notice here in Devon, it's getting darker by the minute. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't hardly like, see. I'm so I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lee, thank you ever so much. And what a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you very much for being part of the... Well, it, it was the first On the Sofa with series, so we really appreciate your time. No problem. Any time. Any time. Um, be good to get involved again in the future once we have a bit more news on what's going on, maybe through the season, or if we get somebody else on, get Rob on. And I'll tell him to his face how greedy he was. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what we can organise then. <laughs> Hopefully we'll be able to get a bit, bit of a bigger couch and get some of the some of the characters from before on. I don't know if the supporters club can afford a bigger couch, can they, Hannah? I'm not really sure. my <laughs> name. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure that's an offer they cannot refuse. <laughs> Yeah, so also a big thank you to you, Vic, for helping us out again this evening. Um, I'm sure you'll be back with us for many more of these in the, as the series carries on. A pleasure. Uh, it, as it's getting very, very dark, I'm not really sure what I'm doing at the minute, but I, I'll, be, <laughs> I'll be back. Yes, next week I think we're back. Uh, so we're looking forward to it very much. Thank you. We are indeed. So our guest for next week will probably be revealed tomorrow. Um, so have a look out for that one. Um, and there'll also be a few other guests to be looking out for in the coming weeks. So uh, make sure you look out for those. And don't forget, if you want to go to the Just Giving page uh, for the Prospect Hospice, uh, a wonderful cause, of course, and we'd appreciate it if you want to uh, donate to them. And we should also say uh, to the Swindon Town Community Foundation, who are doing fantastic work during this time, I know many have ordered those snoods, uh, which uh, look fantastic. So well done to the Swindon Town Community Foundation at the work that they're doing as well. Hannah, happy birthday to you tomorrow. <laughs> happy birthday to Peter Norris and Lee Peacock again. Thank you so much for your time. What a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thanks. See you later, guys. <laughs>